I've been arguing in my head with uh, people who aren't here, with whom I don't argue in person because it's tiresome. Uh, but said person has a way of getting his point across anyway, as in yelling over top of me in non sequiturs to make sure that I hear what he wants me to hear. History. I want to tell you about history. Now, there are ways, there are kinds of history. There's your personal history. That's the old man shouting, On my day, people were Back in my day, well, I know people. I've been around a while. I know what I've seen. Well, I know what I know, when I know what I know. That's personal history. That's great. It's what we basically run on. Uh, with any luck, before we got stupid, our parents managed to share some of their personal history in the form of wisdom to bump up our knowledge of the world. And that's great. And there's no question that the best time to learn is as a child. Children are more open to learning. They don't already have an opinion that you have to cast aside to get through. Um, they don't have hopes and dreams and wishes that your teaching is going to somehow interfere with. See, my parrot hears me talking, and he starts. He's been quiet all morning. But he's going to do this because I'm talking. Uh, I think it's the intensity of my voice when I'm doing my rants that gets, me, gets him upset. And the dog may start barking any minute now because their favorite dog is being walked past the window. But she's sleeping, I guess. Yeah, so that's personal history. My personal history is all about your experience and you, you need to work with it you know like for instance your personal history of learning that every time someone is extravagant with gifts the odds are they're going to turn around and abuse you as soon as you warm up to them and let down your guard you know that's a really that's a really simple one people who are generous with their gifts should be looked at twice i'm afraid uh, as useful as they may be you got to look twice there's not that many people out there with, that are rich enough to just sort of give stuff away for the sheer fun of it. But when we talk about history and we start talking about the Spanish flu, Magna Carta and all of that, this is a bigger thing. This is a recording by the human race for the human race. People in the past speaking to us here in the future as we speak to the people in the future. When you write a diary, um, when you write a letter to somebody, all your emails. In fact, right now, the, the record of history being created right now is ridiculously huge. Every time somebody left a love note, a pile of love notes in a chimney or a diary under a bed or a report, a field report back to headquarters or even wrote down a receipt for, for grocery purchase. Every last one of these things is our collective history. When I try to explain that based on history, X, Y, or Z is, is, is more likely or you know, well, humans are like Z, Y, you know, A, B, C, or anything like that. My favorite demon will come back at me with, oh, the shadow organizations have rewritten all the books. In his mind, history is a specific library in a specific place where um, a specific collection of books are held and that these books can be removed and replaced and history will be changed because no other source of information exists except this mystical source, which in his mind must look like um, a Harry Potter library with the word history written on the front of it. And that some magical people have gone through this magical library and rewritten all the books to suit their agenda. That this is a thing that can and has been done. And that's the trouble with bad education. A good education forces you to write some history yourself. I kid you not, one of the things that I learned in history class was how to write history. Um, we were required to find out, to find information from the past um, using 
documents that have survived since then using artifacts, evidence, documents. So um, archaeology is an extreme form of that where you're digging for that evidence and now we think of artifacts. That's where you find a broken chip of a tooth and figure out that it was a new dinosaur. You know, and, and there's so much more to it than looking at the chip of the tooth and having a magical insight of what it looked like. Uh, there's so much science that goes into it. And that is a form of history. The Diary of Anne Frank does not stand alone. The Diary of Anne Frank is a historical document which, yeah, could have been made up. Absolutely could have been made up. There's no doubt, no question. Um, all evidence technically could have been made up. And historians understand that too. That's another thing they taught us in history class. And no, I'm not a historian and I did not take history class. But it turns out I'm actually a bit of a history buff. I never knew that. <laughs> but once the internet came along with all of its information, I discovered I am a big history buff. So the Diary of Anne Frank does not stand in isolation. It is not a sole piece of evidence. There are... Hmm, I don't know if the word billions is big enough, and I don't know how to count higher than, a, than, than nine... I don't know how to count that high. <laughs> but there is so such a preponderance of evidence that there just isn't anybody with that much interest to create that much evidence to place it in that many places and that many memories to find that many people willing to tell the tale. And so that is how we know that the Holocaust was real and that Anne Frank lived and that the diary was real. Not because the diary is there, but because of the incredible um, panoply of evidence and the range and distance from which that evidence is gathered. This evidence is found from one end of the globe to the other, millions of voices, millions of samples, shoes and artifacts and goods left behind after people were killed. It's just the volume of evidence is outrageous and that is the point I'm making. When someone says to you, oh well, you know, they rewrite that history. How can you possibly rewrite millions and millions of suitcases all stacked up in a warehouse for anybody to see? Very often the only thing you have to do is buy a ticket into the museum to see it. They didn't make that, you see, now there you go again. See, I can hear this demon in my head now. And it's imaginary, but it's me anticipating. It's not a real, actual, living something in my head. There's only one person in here. That's the person that says me. But that person has a lot of voices, which are parts of my psyche. And not the least... And I think that we all have voices in our head that are parts of our psyche. I think with schizophrenic... Um, they just are hyper-focusing on the voices and getting anxious about it. And so the voices become more of a thing as they age. Uh, you know, when you're a kid and you first have, you first have crazy thoughts, people teach you that. They, they teach you things like, well, you know, that's the devil speaking is one of the happiest, one of the easiest ones. But, you know, um, oh, we all have two sides to us. We've got a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other. You know... That's all the voices in your head are. And schizophrenics, I mean, we're not treating them correctly because we're treating them like they're crazy. And what they are is people who do not know how to put their voices in context or in, in their place. And so, you know, when I walk back, when I walk past a sharp knife and I get a weird I daymare image of me reaching out and slicing my finger on it just to see how sharp it is. A schizophrenic thinks a person is telling them to do that. I think my brain's just doing a goofy thing. I know perfectly well, but I'm not going to do that. And I've talked to other people. I've talked to quite a few people, sane ones, happy ones, functioning ones, people who are not having malfunction in their lives, and they too will have these things. Back to history. So history is 
not made up of a small selection of things that can be willfully altered. You can alter history in a local area, but you can't alter global history. You can't erase fully. The archaeology will eventually come and find it. There are instances where locally history was erased. An entire people eradicated, wiped out, not talked about. And yet, even though the people who wiped out that culture and hold that shame managed to bury it so completely that you wouldn't know it's there, still are being brought to attention about their own history. They're still, their children are learning about what their elders did. There's, um, oh, I don't remember the details. Evan Hadfield recently put out a rare earth where he talked about, um, no, it wasn't, was it? Or was it geography now? Couldn't tell you. I'm sorry. Watch them both. It doesn't matter. They're both fabulous. Geography now and rare earth. Fabulous. I even support Rare Earth on Patreon. One of less than a half a dozen I do. A dominating culture had completely eradicated the Indians and believed that the Indian tribe, Ecuador, it's in Ecuador, the Indian tribe was fully wiped out as far as they were concerned. Fully wiped out. Until someone started doing comprehensive DNA testing because they didn't wipe out the awareness that the tribe existed and therefore the genocide. They didn't wipe that part out. Uh, the people who did it were too damn proud of themselves and they stamped it all over history. And there are too many references over too many years to the slaughter of these helpless people by these prideful fools that there's no way to deny that it happened. But they were able to put the shame and the feelings and everything else in the past say, well, that was them, not us, and they're gone now, and we don't need to worry about reparations, and we don't need to worry about all this. You know, we're not in this indigenous rights conversation because, you know, ours are all gone. <laughs> it turned out that everybody in the country has DNA from that tribe in them, just about. <laughs> they're all, they've all all of them descended into being part of that tribe that no longer exists. And that's the trouble with history. Sooner or later, somebody uncovers it. There was a 30-year-old cold case sir, saved, um, solved recently. The uh, 30, over 30 years old. The man, the murderer had escaped scot-free and picked up a new life and was managing to ruin that too because murderers don't get that way while they're being perfectly tolerable people. You know, sociopaths like Ted Bundy are interesting or whoever. There's sometimes a sociopath can maintain a home life and a family. But most of the time... Um, you know, these murdering people, people who rape and murder... The problem that caused them to rape and murder is pretty blasted big. And they're not going any, you know, they're not succeeding. But they uncovered it because people got to talking again and again and again. And somebody who knew, who had a friend, let's see, um, one of the people who was connected with the history was friends with someone who was a co-worker of the murderer. who has never been suspected he had left the day after he did the deed and everyone and he was just a young man and everyone nobody knew that there was any connection between him and the victim and then they they figured they they, they figured it out now they couldn't do anything about it because you have to have it's not enough to suspect you have to have evidence you have to have proof i mean innocent until proven guilty not suspected guilty and as it happens, the guy was super cagey about his own DNA. It's like he knew that someone one day was going to come try to collect his DNA. Um, he was the only employee, for instance, that cleaned his own uniform at home. And they, they listed it in the show. At any rate, 
They did manage to finally get a hold of his DNA. He almost squeaked out on a technicality, but they managed to they managed to convict him and uh, make him pay for the crime that he did and take responsibility. Even though for 30 years he thought that history was buried. And certainly when the crime was done, the DNA wasn't, um, DNA matching wasn't yet a thing. They did blood typing and they did fingerprint matching, but they didn't have the DNA uh, ability. So history eventually comes through. And historians aren't walking up to some magic library that some evil genius can change. They are gathering and they are writing and they are rewriting. And sometimes they do rewrite history. Sometimes a historian will go, look what I found. I just found this diary here from this person who said that they had this experience. And that is unlike anything that we have learned. And yet it connects more properly with the physical evidence we've always had than the official story ever did. It solves some mysteries that we've been wondering about. You know, um, probably like me to come up with a connection. Let's say, let's say Salem claimed they had never burned a witch, never hung a witch, never tortured a witch, never had witch trials, and had managed in Salem to remove all and burn all of the um, diaries, logs, and reports. And all of the people in town had all agreed never to talk about it again. And yet then 200 years, and I'm making this up, please understand, this is n fiction. And then we'll pretend that 200 years later, somebody found a diary of somebody who was at a witch trial. And then it explains the weird graves, it explains missing parts in people's histories, it explains missing chunks of logs or logs that are completely different from normal because one guy sat down and scribbled them out to replace the existing logs. This It starts to explain anomalies is what they call that. Things that they, 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 you know, they look at it and they go, something's wrong with this piece of, with this document. There's something wrong with this document. It doesn't look real. It doesn't look the same as all the other documents created at this time by these people. Why is this document different? So if someone's given you that, if they're trying to tell you that history has been rewritten and that you can't trust history, that is a light streak on the ceiling, by the way, reflecting off of a vehicle window. If people are trying to tell you that, you, that history can be rewritten, Right away, what you've got in front of you is a person without sufficient education to have any business in the discussion at hand. And you should shut that stuff down. You're not going to be able to teach them. They don't want to learn from you. They want to teach you. They're not here to acquire information. They're not here to um, experience you, understand you, get to know you better. Um, they're here to teach you something. You haven't paid for lessons. You haven't signed up for a class. You haven't even asked a question. This insane old man, and they're not always old men, and they're not always men, but it's the preponderance of them are old men. They're just like, yes, in here, I got something to tell you. You know, if you clicked on his video, groovy, cool, no problem, go ahead, listen. Um, but I do want you to start learning to recognize when someone hasn't got a flipping clue what's going on. You can't rewrite history. You can create errors and anomalies that other people will research in the future. That's about the best you can do. You can temporarily get away with something. You can temporarily wipe out your shame, but it's temporary. Someone eventually comes and digs up the truth sooner or later. You may die first, which is, I guess, the goal is to die with the history apparently changed. But eventually, the truth comes out. The truth will out. Um, and that's true of what's happening in our current times. History will judge us. 
and you cannot control how history is going to judge you. You can't control how they're going to feel about things. You're not going, you can't control the point of view that the future is going to have, and you can't control the information they're going to be able to find. You are contributing to it right now. I am, I just contributed to it with this video. And everything you say and do that isn't just spoken to the air and lost is being recorded. There is more history now because of that. Um, it used to be that you just spoke into the air and the closest you got to a record was someone's memory of the conversation. And we know what personal memory is like. Uh, it's, that's another reason why you shouldn't be putting your personal memory over and above written documents by historical scholars, even for your own lifetime, because even me with my eidetic memory, um, I have to leave an, an uncertainty factor. I have to. In fact, I've been, I've had narcissists take advantage of that so many times, using that uncertainty factor like it's a chip in the armor to pick, pick, pick away at my certainty of what I remember until they can try and rewrite my personal memory with the story they want me to remember. I've seen it being done to me. It's, it's where my strength comes from because I have learned to stand up for myself and to trust myself and to say no. I agree that I could have made a mistake, but I trust my own mind to recognize where the holes are in my memory, to recognize them and not fill them in and patch them over. I know my brain doesn't do it, and I trust that my brain is still not doing it. And that's how I get around that gaslighting. But we, and that's exactly what these history deniers, you know, Holocaust deniers, people who insist that the Spanish flu wasn't so bad, people who um, think that your immune system should take on all comers and that the human race gets stronger when we let other people die. These are people who have never learned about history. They don't know that they are playing into a stereotype of the fool that drowned while Noah floated away. All right. One of the biggest myths in our culture that many people still will insist is utterly true that the ark existed, Noah existed, the flood happened. And Noah floated away while his neighbors drowned. And his neighbors were the deniers, were the, the, the anti-science people. His neighbors were the people that refused to listen because they knew better. And those are the people that you're running into right now they don't want to wear a mask and they want to get the economy open early and they don't believe that the virus is real and it doesn't really matter. They are denying the situation. They're denying the reality they're in because they don't like it and they think they can make it be the reality they want if they yell loud enough. <whistles> Peanut Gallery over there gets it and I love that about him. He knows when to put in the right he knows when to interject properly. And um, you know, I'm blessed that he came to live with me. All right. You, you want to see him? Yeah. Let me walk you through my house and you can see him. See, that's where you were sitting is on that windowsill while I washed the dishes. And now, houseplant goes by the living room living room. It's a shabby little house, but I'm not ashamed because I keep it clean. Okay. There he is. He hates cameras, but there you go. What do you think, Sam? You want to say hi? Just get that thing out of your face? <laughs>